everybody. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good day, or good evening, depending on where you are. That's the common practice now in uh, the uh, cyberspace. Uh, we have a diverse group of participants from uh, all across the world. And uh, uh, let me welcome you on behalf of the uh, Economic Policy Research Center. I'm Shota Guineria, uh, 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 the senior fellow at the Re Economic Policy Research Center. And uh, we are uh, very happy to offer you this uh, hopefully very interesting discussion in cooperation with the United States Embassy in Tbilisi uh, on the uh, great power competition in the Black Sea region. And we will introduce the topic in a little bit, but before that, let me welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Matthew Croning, uh, who is the um, who is uh, the professor at the Georgetown University. Uh, he was uh, nominated as uh, top twenty-five most cited political scientists in 2019. So uh, it's an enormous privilege to have him here for, for this discussion. Uh, he has also an experience, extensive experience in the public service and he worked for a number of uh, uh, state institutions in the United States. So what we're looking at here is a great blend of academic and practical knowledge and experience uh, um, and and uh, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having this discussion uh, with you, uh, Matthew, and thank you for being with us. And later on in the discussions, we will be also uh, joined by Christopher Anderson, who is the uh, cultural attache of the United States in uh, uh, the embassy uh, in Tbilisi. So, uh, Without uh, further ado, uh, let me just briefly try to uh, put some, let's say, uh, thought-provoking uh, teasers on the table before we <laughs> before we start with the opening remarks by Professor uh, Croning. Uh, let me start by uh, saying that uh, the Black Sea security has become a hot topic for discussions recently in the Euro-Atlantic, uh, 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 let's say, a political discourse. Unfortunately, not for so good reasons, and uh, the, all, all the reasons are uh, quite uh, depressing because uh, the steps that the Russian Federation has taken in recent years uh, in the Black Sea and South Caucasus regions are uh, actually uh, aimed at uh, increasing destabilization, destabilizing those countries, annexation, occupation, uh, and uh, destabilization are sort of the, the highlights of uh, Russia's policy. And unfortunately, year by year, Russia managed to increase its influences in the region. After the annexation of Crimea, Russia has become already a major Black Sea power. Before, Russia was not a major Black Sea power. It did not have a significant uh, uh, exit to the Black Sea. Now, with uh, what uh, uh, Russia claims as its own territorial waters around Crimea, it has the possibility to actually bend military balance to its favor by heavy militarization of Crimea. And actually it can, uh, uh, it, it is endangering uh, uh, of the countries of the region, uh, not only on the uh, Eastern uh, coast of the Black Sea, uh, but also the member, NATO member states, such as Ukraine, uh, such as, sorry, uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, and Turkey. And of course, the uh, special partners uh, for NATO, such as Ukraine and Georgia, are, uh, are uh, the subject of, uh, uh, let's say, military aggression uh, and invasion uh, from the Russian Federation. Then the Second Karabakh War uh, also contributed to the increase of influences uh, of the Russian Federation. We have seen that the international mechanisms have not been 
very effective in dealing with the conflicts that we have in that part of the world. And Russia has sort of monopolized this conflict resolution processes by weaponizing again occupation and annexation and heavy military presence in the region. So as a result of that, I would say that uh, now the Black Sea region is the most exposed uh, segment of NATO. It is a NATO's headache. It is obviously a headache for all the countries in the region and Ukraine and, and Georgia are not an exception. So with, uh, with this uh, little, uh, uh, not so, uh, let's say positive uh, kickoff, uh, I hope that uh, you, Professor Kronig, will take it over from here and give us your own uh, or your own uh, opinion and ideas about uh, about uh, what is going on in the bigger picture in the Black Sea region here. What are the great power interests? What is the United States doing here? What is what are the compelling interests that move U.S. strategy? What are how are Europeans looking at all this and how uh, is Russia actually uh, uh, reacting to the policies of, uh, e, uh, of uh, uh, the US, uh, EU and NATO in the region? So please, the floor is yours. Great, well, thank you very much for that generous introduction, Ambassador. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here speaking at EPRC and um, pleasure to be virtually back in Georgia. It would be better to be there uh, in person. I think the last time I was there in person was about uh, 10 years ago. So look forward to coming back in person when um, possible. Uh, so you've laid out a, a daunting um, set of challenges in the Black Sea, and I, I'm going to get directly to those, but I, I will start with the bigger uh, framing. And I'm the head of global strategy at the Atlantic Council think tank, so I uh, often start um, globally. And so let me actually start with the, um, uh, the end of World War II, uh, because um, you know, I think after World War II, the United States and some of its like-minded allies established you know, what's often today called a, a rules-based um, international system. Uh, and um, I, I think that is the right term for this post-World War II uh, system, because what is remarkable about it is the dense set of rules and institutions uh, that govern international politics. And if you look back in history, you, you, it, it is um, unprecedented in, in that way, having this um, dense set of rules. Uh, and the system worked because it was backed by uh, powerful democracies like the United States uh, that tried to promote security in important regions like Europe and Asia through alliances, uh, tried to promote um, open markets uh, uh, domestically and globally, uh, and tried imperfectly to promote uh, democracy and good governance. Um, and if you just look at the uh, effects of this system, I think it's been uh, remarkably um, successful, um, really unprecedented levels of peace, prosperity, and security uh, globally. So zero great power wars in 70 years. Um, if you look at um, uh, uh, deaths in warfare from 1600 to 1945, 1 to 2% of the world's population could expect to die in armed conflict. Now that number is less than uh, one-tenth of 1%. Um, prosperity, 66% of the world's population lived in poverty before 1945, 10% today. Uh, so still too high, but um, yeah, much better. Um, standards of living have multiplied around the world. Uh, and then democracy and good governance. We, we often forget um, before World War II, there were only a handful of democracies uh, in Europe. Now the entire uh, continent is, is free, um, uh, much of Asia and yeah, 100 Roughly 100 countries around the world are classified as democratic uh, today. Uh, so the world is, is safer, richer, and freer than it used to be. Um, now, um, you know, great power rivalry, the subject of our talk today, has been something that's gone on since the beginning of recorded um, human history. And I actually have a book that came out last year called The Return of Great Power Rivalry, and I start with the Greeks and the Persians 2,500 years ago. Uh, but you did really have this remarkable period after the end of the um, Cold War, where, um, at least from Washington's point of view, great power rivalry uh, had ended, and there was really a lot of optimism uh, that Russia was going to become a more market-based economy, more democratic, uh, that it would become cooperative, maybe it could even join NATO. Uh, and then, similarly, a hope that China would become a so-called responsible stakeholder uh, in a rules-based international system. I think what we've seen over the past um, 15 years is that that was the wrong um, expectation and that Putin and Xi 
uh, have decided that, that this system is a threat to them uh, and that they're going to try to disrupt uh, and displace it. And, and so beginning with uh, Russia, and this is a subject that uh, you, you all know well and you've experienced um, directly, you know, the, where do you date this return of great power rivalry? There are a number of dates you can choose, but, but looking back, it probably was the 2008 uh, in Russian invasion of Georgia that should have been the wake-up call uh, to the rest of the world. It, it really wasn't, uh, to be honest, it really wasn't until the invasion of Ukraine, I think, that Europe and the United States really awoke to the Russian threat, but it, it should have been 2008. Uh, and so Russia continues uh, these military uh, threats as, as the ambassador um, pointed out. There is really a concern in Washington about uh, Russian military activity um, in the Black Sea region. Um, after the invasion of Ukraine, there was a lot of focus of, of reinforcing uh, the Baltic states and Poland because they were seen as vulnerable. I think they, they, they still uh, are vulnerable, um, but uh, less of a focus on kind of NATO's um, you know, Black Sea flank, but, but that's changing. Uh, and um, uh, United States and Romania, United States and other partners uh, like Georgia uh, and Ukraine are, are in discussions, uh, taking actions uh, about how to, how to strengthen uh, this area. Uh, but of course, there is the, the danger that Russia could uh, take more military activity. We're seeing the massing of its forces in uh, Ukraine uh, right now. Um, beyond Europe, it, it also, of course, um, intervened in Syria, establishing itself as a Middle Eastern power broker for the first time since the 1970s. Um, so the Russian military threat is, is quite serious. Um, you know, when it comes to other types of challenges, economic, you know, uh, Russia is not a major economic uh, power. It, it can use its pipeline politics uh, for influence. Uh, and then diplomatically, Russia is not a major uh, power either. It's not very good at building um, alliances. It has been more effective, though, at disrupting uh, others' uh, alliances and uh, trying to interfere with NATO and uh, the European Union um, through disinformation, election interference, and um, I know that uh, you're a major target of that in uh, Georgia. And you know, it's a pretty sophisticated <coughs> um, um, operation. Some of the messaging, the way it's targeted, uh, but if you take a step back, you you can see that it. it doesn't really make sense. The messages um, conflict with each other. And, you know, often the purpose of the disinformation, I think, is just to confuse uh, people who aren't paying uh, close attention to say, well, this is really complicated. I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, what's going on. Uh, so, so Russia continues to uh, cyber attacks are, are another part of the uh, challenge that I should have mentioned. Um, uh, so Russia is really disrupting uh, this system. Uh, the United States is concerned. Uh, from the U.S. point of view, though, that the bigger threat may come from China uh, and a fear that China is, is maybe trying to displace the system altogether, set up its own um, international system. Uh, so China's economy is growing. Some economists predict that it could overtake the United States uh, within the decade. Um, it's investing a lot of that economic power into military capabilities, uh, shifting the balance of power in Asia. Many U.S. Defense planners uh, worry whether the United States can defend longstanding partners in the region like Taiwan. Um, uh, China's engaging in this massive nuclear buildup, as, as you may have heard. It seems that it wants to become a nuclear superpower on par with the United States uh, and Russia. Um, and then uh, China's also gaining influence uh, with, uh, through its um, economy. Uh, and the Belt and Road investments, and I know it's um, China's made some infrastructure investments um, in Georgia, you know, and so this is a mixed bag. On, on one hand, uh, a lot of the world does need infrastructure, roads, ports, bridges. On the other hand, I think we see that these Chinese investments come with uh, strings attached. Um, the, the standards aren't often up to uh, Western standards in terms of environmental uh, degradation and, and the quality of the work. Um, the economic benefits are often not as great as the recipient countries host because it's Chinese companies and Chinese uh, workers uh, doing a lot of the work. Uh, and then also it, it can become a, a tool of um, coercion. And we've seen this with the debt trap uh, diplomacy in Sri Lanka, for example, where Sri Lanka was unable to make payments on a port. And so the Chinese um, seized control of the port. Uh, and um, some in the West fear that this may become a new Chinese uh, military base uh, in um, Sri Lanka. Uh, and then if you look at, at governance and uh, diplomacy, uh, China is also 
um, a problem engaging in genocide uh, at home, uh, and then um, using its influence in international institutions to really turn the purpose of the institutions uh, away from their intended uh, goal. And uh, we see that most clearly with the uh, World Health Organization, where China to this day uh, prevents an effective um, investigation into COVID's origins, which makes COVID uh, worse for the rest of us and uh, makes a reoccurrence uh, more likely. Um, so um, the United States was slow to awaken to this challenge, but the 2017 national security strategy says this great power competition uh, with Russia and China is the foremost uh, priority of U.S. Uh, strategy. Um, so, um, you know, I think many people are, are pessimistic uh, in, uh, in, in the broader West, in the democratic world. Uh, and um, it's one of the reasons I was motivated to write this book, because I often hear, well, the, you know, these dictatorships uh, can be so effective. You know, Putin can act quickly and decisively. Uh, he can plan for the long term. Um, he's not constrained by laws or institutions. He can do what's necessary. Meanwhile, in the democratic world, we're divided, we're polarized. Uh, we're weak, we, we look to the next election, we can't um, look for the long term, we're focused on our internal scandals. Um, and and uh, so this book looks at uh, competitions between democracies and autocracies for the past 2,500 years and, and actually concludes that democracies uh, do pretty well, that we have real strengths in these competitions and, and the dictators have real uh, challenges. Um, you know, so uh, democracies um, ha have good economic institutions that lead to long run growth and, and innovation. Um, democracies are the uh, uh, often become uh, financial centers because people trust investing in, in democracies. And that's true even for uh, the Russians and the Chinese, uh, you know, wealthy Russians um, um, put their uh, money in, in London and in uh, New York City. Uh, because they know their investments will be safe there. They're not safe uh, in Russia. Um, uh, they're bad at building alliances, as I've said. And in fact, Russia, if you look uh, over the past hundred years, uh, has fought almost as many wars with its allies uh, as it has with its um, enemies. You know, it fought Nazi Germany when they were allied in World War II, uh, invaded two Warsaw Pact members during the Cold War, um, invaded Georgia and Ukraine when you were all uh, part of this Commonwealth of Independent States. Um, and then uh, militarily, Russia is punching above its weight, but there are some weaknesses there as, as well. In fact, both Russia and China, uh, well, the challenge dictators face is they're more afraid of their own people uh, than of the external enemy. Uh, and Russia and China spend more on internal security than they do on their militaries, uh, whereas the United States is um, two to one in the other uh, direction. Um, so democracies, I think, are uh, good at economic growth, are good at building alliances and partnerships, uh, and do have some military advantages, including that they can actually focus on the enemy, not on repressing um, their own people. Um, so I think we should have um, some more confidence um, going into this competition. Um, so, so what should we do about it, including um, in the Black Sea uh, region? And <coughs> I'm at the Atlanta Council think tank where you know, in addition to my position at Georgetown, as I mentioned, I'm uh, the director of the Global Strategy Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we came out with a major China strategy last year. We're coming out with a major Russia strategy in, in just a few weeks. Uh, but they share a, a similar logic. And, and so uh, first, it says we need to strengthen ourselves. And if you think about any competition, uh, like an athletic competition, it's not so much about tearing down the other guy. It's about making yourself uh, as strong as possible. Uh, and so I think that's the first step. Uh, and, um, you know, making sure our institutions and our democracies are, are strong at home uh, is an important step. And uh, Biden is um, you know, kind of doing that uh, today with his summit for democracy in, in Washington, bringing democracies together uh, to discuss shared challenges. Um, second, I think, is strengthening our, our alliances. And um, NATO has done uh, quite a bit to strengthen itself since 2014. Uh, uh, in bringing in new members like Montenegro, new deployments in, of uh, military forces in Eastern Europe. Um, I was in Lithuania in September at Camp Herkus, uh, this new U.S. military camp uh, in um, uh, Eastern Lithuania, right on the border with Belarus. So, you know, really remarkable. Ten years ago, it would be hard to imagine there's a U.S. Army camp uh, on the border of Belarus, but uh, that's where we are today. Um, increases of um, U.S. warships transiting in, in the Black Sea, 
you know, because of uh, treaties, difficult for the United States to have um, uh, uh, war warships there for long, but um, increasing uh, a presence there. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, and, and also I think, um, you know, thinking about new alliances and partnerships and very much hope that uh, Georgia becomes a member of NATO um, someday. Um, and, um, you know, broader groupings as well. And at the Atlanta Council, we've talked about creating a new D10 of kind of the 10 leading democracies working together on shared challenges. Um, and uh, the Summit for Democracy this week, uh, we have a new report saying that this should become a global alliance uh, of democracies, that not just uh, one meeting, but, you know, there should be annual meetings or, or more, uh, kind of like the G7, where uh, leaders from uh, the world's leading democracies get together to discuss shared challenges and um, shared uh, approaches. Um, uh, also, I think part of um, strengthening our, ourselves uh, needs to be dealing with the you know, as we think about strengthening our democracies, dealing with the disinformation problem, I, I think is a serious one, and in, including in the Black Sea um, region. Uh, and so some of the steps uh, there, um, you know, Voice of America, uh, Radio uh, Free Europe, uh, the United States has increased uh, spending on, on those institutions. Uh, Jamie Fly, an old friend and colleague of mine, is, is the head of uh, Radio Free Europe now, and I know he's passionate about uh, his role in countering Russian disinformation. And I think supporting independent media is important um, and um, educating the public uh, on, on disinformation, how to spot it, uh, I think is also important. Um, and I mentioned I was in Lithuania. They have a government disinformation office. And I think Washington, maybe Tbilisi could learn something uh, from them. It's a, a really a clever way to kind of uh, spot Russian disinformation, announce it to the public, serve as a clearinghouse for journalists to check. Um, stories that they're hearing. Um, strengthening ourselves in terms of infrastructure, I, I think, is also important. Uh, you know, for, for a long time, countries seeking major infrastructure investments, um, China was the only game in town, and so it made sense that they were looking to China. Um, so the uh, democratic world is trying to counter that, and Biden has this Build Back Better World plan that he's announced that would try to harness private sector investment uh, in the West to make uh, major infrastructure investments um, in Eastern Europe, in, in the Black Sea region, uh, and elsewhere. So I think that's pillar one, strengthen ourselves. Um, pillar two, I, I do think we need to um, hit back uh, and where uh, these uh, revisionist autocratic powers, Russia and China, are, are challenging us, uh, threatening us, uh, threatening, um, uh, contravening widely held international norms. I, I do think they need to pay a stiff uh, cost for that. And so I think part of that is um, sanctions, uh, and there have been tough sanctions put in place on Russia since uh, 2014. It has hurt its economy. Uh, we just heard yesterday Biden threatening even tougher sanctions if uh, Russia were to move further into Ukraine. Um, sanctions against uh, the Chinese for their genocide um, at home. Um, and then um, militarily, I think uh, we need to push back uh, as well. And um, I think that uh, Russia should worry uh, about military escalation with uh, NATO when it engages in um, aggression against Ukraine, Georgia, uh, or, or um, otherwise. Uh, and then, you know, the United States, the Pentagon is uh, very concerned also about the Indo-Pacific and making investments there to make sure that China can't engage in aggression against Taiwan um, or other allies and partners. Uh, and then the final pillar, you know, we're going to strengthen ourselves, we're going to push back against the dictators. Um, I think I think there should be an engagement track. Uh, I think uh, you know, just like Biden did in his virtual summit uh, this week, I think it does make sense to try to talk to Putin, uh, to talk to Xi um, about uh, shared challenges, arms control, uh, climate change. No, no, I'm not naive. I don't think that's going to lead to a major breakthrough, but I do think it makes sense to keep uh, the lines of communication open. Uh, and then, so what what is the point uh, of this? What what does success? Uh, look like? Wh where do we want to get with um, uh, relations with Russia, relations with China um, eventually? And, um, you know, I, I think there's a debate about this in, in Washington. What is the goal um, of great power competition? Uh, and um, so what I would argue, what we argue in these reports, uh, is that actually the goal in the 90s and the 2000s um, was the right one. 
Um, eventually, we would like a cooperative, stable relationship uh, with Russia and China. Um, it, it just doesn't seem possible anytime soon. It doesn't seem possible as long as Putin is in power, as long as she is in power. Uh, and so I, I think the goal should be to persuade the next generation of Russian leaders, uh, the next generation of Chinese leaders, uh, that this aggressive approach uh, hasn't worked. Um, that uh, this aggressive approach from Putin and from Xi has actually been bad for Moscow uh, and for Beijing, uh, that challenging uh, the United States, its allies and partners, challenging uh, the free world um, is too difficult, it's too costly for Beijing and Moscow, uh, and that they're better off pursuing a more cooperative um, approach. And so I think if we can do that, maybe we can uh, maintain this uh, rules-based international system, strengthen it, revitalize it, uh, for a new era and with any luck have another 75 years of peace, uh, prosperity and an increasing freedom. Uh, so I think I'll end my remarks there and uh, very much look forward to Q&A and discussion. Well, great. Thank you very much for this all-encompassing introduction, actually. Yeah, we had so much information uh, in uh, uh, the condensed uh, period of time. And I guess uh, our audience can't wait to start asking questions. So I would encourage uh, uh, everybody to start typing up their questions because that's the way we will uh, take uh, uh, questions from the audience. So we can already start doing that. But before, uh, before uh, I turn it over to the audience, I would like to use my privilege as the moderator and ask a couple of questions from my side. And uh, let me also start from the bigger picture as you uh, did. Uh, and let me ask you about this um, uh, rules-based international system versus the revisionism that we see unfolding uh, here in the Black Sea. So I would, I, I would see if, if I would say if there is any place where one could study and learn and research what revisionism in Russia's understanding means, they should look into the Black Sea. And what they try to do here is exactly that. They try to push back the, uh, uh, the rules and norms that were agreed uh, under the UN Charter and then later uh, uh, under the Helsinki Final Act. And then, you know, they, uh, have been fighting with the weapons in their hands against those rules and fundamental principles of the European security architecture in the Black Sea starting in 2008, as you rightly mentioned, uh, which was then seen, unfortunately, as the isolated episode uh, between Russia and Georgia. For us in Georgia and in the region, it was obvious that, you know, this uh, 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 August 2008 was important, not only because of Georgia, but because exactly Russians for the first time dared to uh, uh, attempt to change the uh, internationally recognized borders of the sovereign country in Europe, but it was not seen that way back then. And then it was continued in Ukraine. So the deterrence, uh, uh, actually the reaction of the West on what Russia did in Georgia actually couldn't deter Russia not to do the same thing in Ukraine. So now we are here. Uh, Crimea is annexed. There is a war going on in Eastern Ukraine. And even that is not enough. Now Russia has concentrated hundreds of thousands of troops at the Ukrainian border. So there is uh, some more escalation coming from the Russian Federation, which is a good sign for me that actually the deterrence is failing at this point. And then everybody was uh, so much looking forward to this uh, uh, recent meeting between the two presidents, the United States president and uh, um, uh, President Putin. And uh, I must say that the messaging that we have heard in the first uh, days uh, right after that meeting was not something that uh, many people would expect in Eastern Europe or especially here in the Black Sea uh, region. But uh, 
Then, you know, gradually we have seen that this uh, messaging has become much more clear and we have seen uh, a number of very good statements uh, by the White House today and President uh, Biden has spoken to uh, President Zelensky and the quote of the day today is that no discussion or decisions without Ukraine on Ukraine, which is the uh, absolutely right thing to do. And then there has been another uh, developments as well. Uh, the president, president Biden have uh, 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 engaged with uh, a number of leaders from center and uh, Central and Eastern uh, uh, Europe. And the right message coming out today was that actually we will consult with all the allies and only uh, uh, with the engagement of the all allies we will carve out the response to Russia to Russia's provocations in Ukraine and nobody will ex be excluded neither Ukraine nor nor any of the allies and that's the right thing but but at the same time in parallel we hear absolutely different messaging from Moscow and from Moscow we hear that actually uh, very soon Russia will propose a formal formalized uh, uh, plan for new European security architecture. This is not new. They have been trying to do that for three decades in, in different forms, but now they have gradually built up a blackmailing tool and a capability to actually press the West and the countries of the region to talk them into this sort of kind of a new, a new, uh, new uh, agreements. I will be very honest here, after the first Press uh, 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 press readouts uh, about the, the meeting between the two presidents. I was very worried that this kind of agreement could have gone in a in a wrong place and could have actually played Russia's game in the region. Today, I'm more confident, but I wanted to ask your uh, about your take. So, can you can you see any? chance that Russians can actually blackmail the West into changing the rules and actually making this point that not uh, not the ones that break the rules are problem, but the rules itself are the problem. So how do you see that? Well, well thanks, Ambassador. That was really a, a masterful um, uh, summary of, I, I think, where we are right now. And I, I think you're um, absolutely right. The, the Russia doesn't want a, a, a rules-based um, international system. Uh, it, it, I think it would like to go back to a, a kind of um, 19th century version of great power politics. I, I think it wants to reestablish a, a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe and the Black Sea uh, region. Um, and um, so, so I do think that this is really the, the front lines of, of defending this rules-based international system, because uh, you, you do have some in, in the West, not in government, but more academics uh, saying, well, maybe we should give uh, Russia a sphere of influence, and give them a security uh, give them the security architecture that they want, uh, and then that will be you know all that they want, and we can live you know in, in harmony. But I think we've seen you know uh, historically that you know trying to appease uh, dictators like that uh, doesn't work. Uh, that we do need to draw a firm line here uh, to to defend and expand um, this system, and, and so the U.S. position. Uh, and I think the, the right position is it's not up to Moscow and Washington uh, to decide uh, what kind of organizations Georgia, Ukraine, or other countries uh, can join. It, it's up to uh, the governments and, and to the uh, people. And, and so I think, um, you know, this is a uh, administration that's very pro-Europe and pro-NATO. Um, you, you know, maybe the most pro-European administration we've had since uh, George H.W. Bush um, almost 30 um, years ago. And, and so I, I don't think that they're uh, looking for um, a deal with Russia. I, I, I think it's unlikely that they're going to you know, sell out um, allies and partners in, in Europe in search uh, of a deal. Um, I do think that the, the Biden administration is trying for a, a, a balanced approach with Russia. I think they're, they're worried about going so far that they would provoke Russia and get into a major war. But I do think they're willing to push back. And so we saw Biden threatening uh, you know, the tough economic sanctions the other day. You know, some say that's not enough. I, I might agree with that, although I would say I think the Russians um, are concerned about some of the additional sanctions the United States and the European Union could put in place. Um, Biden also said that uh, there could be additional deployments of U.S. military forces in Eastern Europe if Russia were to move against um, Ukraine. Uh, that's also a deterrent. Uh, Russia doesn't want to see that. 
Um, and then I also agree with you that I, I, I think it was um, uh, good that uh, today Biden's talked about uh, engaging all um, allies because, um, you know, I, I think the statement the other day of four or five allies, you know, uh, caused some concern. You know, either there's a joke in Washington if, um, you know, something seems to be handled poorly. Uh, is it a conspiracy or is it uh, a mistake? And uh, usually it's a mistake. And I think that was true in, in that case. And so it's a good sign that they moved quickly to uh, correct that. Now, if it were, you know, if, if yeah, so I think this is good. You know, I, I would also, if, if I were, uh, you know, if I were asked, adv advise also m maybe some um, military um, uh, posturing from, from the United States just to make Putin worry. You know, not that we're going to fight World War III uh, with uh, Russia over what's uh, what's happening in Ukraine right now, but but make Putin worry um, that, that maybe things, uh, you know, make him worry about escalation. And if we go back to 2008 uh, and the invasion of um, Georgia, you know, there's the interesting um, question of, of why did Russia stop where it did? There, there are different interpretations, but, you know, the United States did send a warship to Batumi. Uh, in the middle of the crisis uh, and said that it was for humanitarian aid. But I think that was a nice show of force that made made Putin worry. And I think something similar now in, in the Black Sea um, or in Poland uh, might might be useful. Well, great. Thank you very much. And actually, you also answered my second follow-up question. I wanted to ask you how the real deterrent for Putin would look like in your understanding. And this was very clear in your answer. So thank you very much for that. Actually, I do agree that uh, by this approach of doing too little and too late for too long, you know, we have already lost a lot of uh, uh, influences to Russia, and now it's really the time to show that uh, there will be real consequences that will be uh, painful for the Russian Federation and for the uh, regime that is there at this moment, uh, because otherwise we, we see that what actually provokes Russia the best is uh, is the ambivalent approach, the opportunity to go forward with the aggressive policies without being punished and without being uh, having uh, to pay the price for that. And then that, that has to end one way or another. And uh, I think that uh, we're absolutely on the same uh, um, page here. So let's see, let's see how the uh, possible uh, package of sanctions that was communicated from President Biden to President Putin will affect uh, Russia's decisions uh, uh, to move forward with, uh, with the invasion or not. But before that, let me ask you one more question, uh, which uh, is more Georgia centric and focused on US Georgia relations, you know, uh, honestly speaking, I see uh, some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, different uh, channels of communication, uh, communicating different uh, kind of uh, let's say relations and uh, information and content between uh, about what is ha happening between the two countries now. So we had an excellent timely visit by the uh, Secretary of Defense and he presented an outstanding program which uh, will actually help Georgia to uh, build up its own defense capabilities and the focus was all in the right places and that's what Georgia desperately needs. But at the same time, you know, what we hear from the uh, political leadership of the Georgian uh, uh, the leadership at this point in response to the criticism for not being able to deliver on the reforms and not being able, you know, to do uh, the, to to build up the democratic institutions that that is absolutely a must, you know, for moving forward towards European and Euro-Atlantic integration forward. And we see there that there is increasing criticism, and every time something happens, we see more and more vocal uh, criticism of the United States uh, 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 officials about the state of uh, democracy in uh, this country, but 
what we hear in response from the Georgian government uh, officials and political leadership does not actually fit into this framework of strategic cooperation and leadership. And it does not sound that these people really do understand that democracy is the core of the strategic partnership between the United States and Georgia. So how would you, how, how does that see from uh, where you are and how would you say this relations between uh, Georgia and the United States go and what, 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 what could we do to engage the United States even more actively in uh, the region and in uh, Georgia in particular? Yes, good question. And um, I think we are fortunate to have a um, State Department official with us to give closing remarks. So he might want to say something about, you know, if official U.S. policy. I'll just from my point of view, I would say um, a couple of things. Uh, first, I think that Secretary Austin, uh, you know, was was right. And, and that, that that is the, the right approach that the United States is committed, uh, unwavering support to Georgia's uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. I think the package of some of the military um, assistance that Austin uh, talked about, you know, is, is needed uh, and that, you know, Georgia is an important security partner. Um, at, at the same time, I, th I think that the United States is also, uh, you know, uh, sincere that uh, in order for Georgia to become a, a member of NATO, which is uh, you know, still the desire uh, that Georgia does need to put in place uh, some of the reforms to uh, strengthen um, its democracy. Um, and, and if you just go to Freedom House, which is an organization, independent organization in Washington that measures democracy around the world, um, it currently <coughs> uh, rates Georgia as, as partly free. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, there is um, some work to be done. Now, I uh, would also say that, you know, uh, I think the United States has humility uh, here as well. Our democracy is not perfect. That's one of the things that Biden said um, in, in the summit uh, for democracy this week. Uh, so I think we all have uh, work to do to, to strengthen our democracies, including in the United States. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I think that's important for Georgia. I, I hope it takes the uh, necessary steps uh, so that we can create uh, together a Europe that's whole and free. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I will uh, now start. Uh, to read uh, the questions from the audience, and there are a couple already. Uh, uh, let me start by the question from uh, uh, about uh, uh, about the hybrid uh, influences and about the uh, disinformation uh, campaigns and the power of information in the in this great power competition. Actually, what what I think is new in today's hybrid warfare is not just a simple fact that uh, the actors are using the combination of military and non-military uh, instruments of national power, which, which has been there in any conflict that was there in the, in the history of the humankind, but the power of information and the uh, far reaching consequences and the facts that one can achieve through a skillful disinformation campaign. And what we see in Georgia today is exactly that. And the question is alluding to that, that we see that uh, Russian influences are gradually growing in Georgia by uh, the successful messaging and narratives. And recently what we have also seen on top of that is that the openly pro-Russian, aggressively pro-Kremlin uh, groups that have, have been identified as the violent groups calling for violence, uh, constantly doing hate speech as their usual communication language, and then physically harassing uh, uh, different minority groups in the streets of Tbilisi are now registered uh, officially as the as the political party, you know, and they have chosen this name conservative, uh, conservative party, which has nothing to do with conservatives. These are the aggressive uh, anti-Western pro-Kremlin, pro-Putin groups, which are directly uh, linked to Russia's hybrid uh, warfare and influences. That's just one of the examples, but we have we, we see more and more of that happening. So what do you see could be done specifically to first 
put this on the agenda of the policymakers as a real problem and as a real threat and make them invest sufficient amount of resources for countering that and then how to push it back of course because we see that we we, we cannot afford uh living this uh, on its own tight because it's growing as a snowball yes good question and, and just to make sure i understand because uh, I, I see two challenges and maybe you're talking about both you know so one is um groups within russia uh, that are not um, officially state sponsored but that um, uh, you know, seem to be doing the Kremlin's bidding with uh, ransomware attacks and other things. You know, second is groups within within our own countries, within Georgia, that are uh, pro-Russians maybe um, getting support from the Kremlin. Are, are you talking more about that second well, category? It's a combination of both, and they're uh, synchronized actions in Georgia. That's what. Good. Well, a, a few things. One, I think some of the things I mentioned in my opening remarks uh, could also um, apply here. Um, educating the public, sponsoring independent um, media, um, uh, you know, to counter disinformation. But uh, in, specifically uh, for this, you know, for the groups inside Russia, you know, I think one thing we can do is not um, allow Russia to have this uh, fiction that these are uh, non-state groups, uh, be because Russia is a, a dictatorship, and if uh, Putin didn't like what these groups were doing. Uh, he could easily um, shut them down. So I, I think we should essentially treat them as um, as state-sponsored um, groups. Um, you know, there are some uh, tougher ways we can um, hit back. Um, some of these, um, it was one of these troll farms that interfered in the U.S. presidential election in 2016. In part, in response to that, the United States changed its cyber uh, policy uh, to a so-called defend forward policy, but basically using offensive cyber operations uh, to counter uh, those kind of operations. So during the 2018 congressional elections, uh, and then again during the 2020 presidential elections, it was reported uh, that U.S. Um, used its cyber capabilities to attack these Russian troll farms to, to take them offline uh, so that they couldn't uh, interfere. Uh, and so maybe there's some opportunities uh, there for coordination on kind of a defend forward uh, campaign against these groups. On, um, on pro-Russian groups um, operating uh, within uh, our countries, and, and you have more experience with the groups in Georgia, obviously. Um, I, I think in the United States, there has been more, uh, well, under the uh, presidency of Donald Trump, there was some more pro-Russian sentiment. But I think often those People don't really understand what Russia uh, is 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 all about, and I don't think under understand that he's not, you know, some conservative, uh, you know, uh, uh, role model. That, that he's a brutal dictator and, and anti uh, Western, and, and um, so I think uh, public education is is part of that. And fortunately, um, you know, I think with um, uh, the, we've seen those polls in the United States have started to revert back to normal. Where Republicans, you know, are seeing not seeing Putin in a positive light. You know, another uh, thing in the United States. I don't know what your policies are in Georgia, but you know, if these groups are are uh, directly sponsored and supported by the Kremlin, uh, we we do have policies um, in the United States, Foreign Agent Registration Act, and and other things uh, that make it difficult for um, citizens of the United States to work on behalf of a hostile. Uh, foreign power. And so uh, maybe, maybe you have laws like that in Georgia. If not, maybe those are things that you could consider uh, to, to make it um, illegal. You know, uh, if uh, there are people working on behalf of a hostile foreign power, you know, it's, uh, uh, um, you know, that's um, uh, something that could be, uh, could be restricted or, or, or made illegal. Great. Thank you. And there is a uh, uh, question on China. And I will try to summarize it shortly. The question actually makes a point that uh, it, I guess that the author of the question has an impression that uh, the United States might be uh, exaggerating the threat that is coming from China at the expense of downplaying the threat uh, of Russia, because what is putting an existential threat to the Euro-Atlantic security 
and the rules-based international system at this point is more Russia than the China. China might be a bigger problem in the future and longer run, but right now we have a fire with Russia, you know, and we have to invest more uh, resources in that. And then the question was that, uh, is there a danger uh, that uh, by, by, let's say, pivoting China versus the Russian threat, we, can, we might, uh, actually give Russia an upper hand to proceed with uh, their uh, super aggressive actions? What do you think? Well, it's a good question. And so I, I do think that both are, are serious threats. And, and you know, unfortunately, I, I can tell a plausible story of, about how we're in a major war with Russia or with China you know, be, before Christmas. You know, if Russia were to move against a NATO country, if China were to um, attack Taiwan. Um, I think that the United States would get in, get involved in both of those uh, conflicts, and, and both of those are unfortunately plausible. So I think they're both um, serious. Um, you know, I think China is the longer term uh, challenge, just given its economic uh, capacity. You know, it, it has the potential to become a real peer competitor um, with the United States uh, across the full spectrum of power. Uh, Russia really does not. You know, uh, the United States is roughly 23% of global GDP right now. Um, you know, China is 16 or 17%, so uh, getting closer. Russia, less than 2%. You know, it's uh, smaller than Spain or, or Italy. So I think Russia doesn't have the ability to kind of overthrow this rules based system, set up its own order. You know, by 2049, China might. So I, I think it's the greater long term challenge. I think I agree with the question, though, that, that Russia may be the more dangerous short term challenge uh, and, and existential threat. You know, uh, Russia has 1,550 nuclear weapons that could land on the United States within 30 minutes, um, you know, uh, before we end this session. Uh, China doesn't have that capability. So I, I think that Russia may be the more dangerous threat. <coughs> is, is there um, a concern that Washington may be getting this wrong? I don't think so. Uh, you do have some in Washington right now saying uh, China and, and Taiwan are, are the foremost priority. Therefore, we should move forces from Europe, move forces from the Middle East, focus everything on, on defending Taiwan. Um, but just in, in the past, uh, last month, the Pentagon came out with this global posture review um, that basically said we're going to keep things the way that they are, keep our forces uh, where they are. Uh, which I saw as a good sign. It, it means we're not drawing down forces uh, from Europe. And uh, I, I read that as a statement that, you know, the United States uh, has been a global power and, and intends to remain a global power. We have important interest in uh, Middle East, Europe, and Asia, and, and that's not changing. Great, great. Thank you very much for that. And the next question is about uh, uh, Ukraine. So uh, the question uh, asks uh, about the timing of the escalation at this moment by Russia. And uh, I, I think I, I also um, wanted to ask this question along the similar lines. You know, what is happening in Belarus? which started all with the Zapad actually in September, Zapad exercise, which was a qualitatively different exercise than it was last year. And we had much more aggressive scenario of occupying the territories of the member states under the Zapad exercise. Then we have seen this uh, irregular migration crisis all played out at the borders of NATO, then at the same time triggering Russia's military presence in Belarus, which is something that Kremlin wa wa wanted for a couple of years. But now I think they found this time when Lukashenko is as weak as ever, delegitimized by the West. So uh, Putin is right now squeezing him as a lemon, you know, and is trying to achieve all the objectives he wanted to achieve with Belarus for years. And then we see this uh, military buildup of Russia in Belarus and the, the, the stationing of uh, the OMON, all, all, all sorts of uh, special forces, as well as the equipment. And then uh, we see this uh, uh, events here on the South Caucasus, aggressively pushing three plus three format, as well as the gains that Russians gained uh, uh, as a result of the Karabakh war. And then 
as we said, also we see that uh, pro-Russian sentiments and influences in Georgia are moving from the marginal towards the uh, uh, mainstream because you know because of the combination of things because I think that the, the government by in best case ambivalence and in the worst case by supporting this uh, uh, increase of the Russia's uh, influences have actually created the basis for that and then now we get we get what we get at the borders of U Ukraine so do you also see connections between these dots or I uh, need to go and see my doctor? No, I think you're you're perfectly sane. Uh, uh, my, my doctorate's in um, political science, though, so I, I don't know if my professional judgment here uh, counts for much. But you know, there's an old um, quote that's attributed to Lenin, uh, and maybe you know this one, but it's um, "Probe with bayonets. If you encounter steel, withdraw. Uh, if you encounter mush, then keep uh, pushing." And I do think that Putin uh, has learned that adage. I think that he probes. Uh, sees what the response is, and if there's a, a tough response, he withdraws. If, if he can keep going, he does. And, and so I, I think to, to some degree, that's what's um, happening here. Putin is probing, seeing what the response is, and as long as there's not a tough response, he's, he's going to keep uh, incrementally um, pushing. You know, in the United States, we often also uh, view the world um, kind of through our own uh, lens. Maybe we all do that. And so I think some in Washington think, well, we, we have a new president uh, in power. He's been there for a year. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, we saw with the withdrawal uh, in Afghanistan that maybe President Biden, you know, is interested in, in uh, reducing U.S. military commitments, at least in some areas. And so I think some in Washington think, is this um, uh, Putin uh, probing uh, a new American president to see, uh, you know, how will, how will Biden uh, respond? So I think that may be uh, part part of it as well, and um, so um, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that uh, the the response um, uh, that we have so far uh, will be will be enough, and um, um, you know, I, I think it has gotten tougher even just in in recent uh, days. So uh, let let's um, let's hope that uh, we put some steel in front of uh, Putin's bayonet, and he decides that now now is not the time. Great, thank you very much. And quick follow up before I turn it over to Christopher Anderson. Uh, and the last question from the chat uh, actually alludes to this final part of what uh, what you just said. Uh, uh, and uh, the specific question goes for the channels of communication and the way we have uh, heard uh, this communicated to Putin that, okay, yes, we will also want to maintain the channels of communication directly. And it was a bit shaky. Now today it's more clear, but uh, um, what uh, would you say? Is there any more room for more clarity that there need? I mean, we do have all the right tools of communication through NATO Russia Council, through other European uh, security institutions, OSC and others. And it's, it is really about the Russians, goodwill from the Russians to achieve progress in this communication. And it's not the problem of the rules or the channels of communication. It's about the content. It's about how Russians behave and how they uh, need to be kept re uh, responsible for what they do. And the, so, well, would you think that too much direct uh, communication uh, and the impression of sidelining the allies from that can encourage Putin to be more aggressive and to think that actually his aggressive policies pay off and there is no iron in front of his uh, uh, actual policies? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So, um, you know, when we think about Russia and um, China, I, I do think that um, they like to try to divide us and, and pick us off. Uh, and so I think if we can, uh, show a unified front, we're at a much stronger position. You know, if it's Xi on one side or Putin on one side and the United States, NATO, Japan, South Korea, Australia, you know, the entire free world on, on the other side of the table, uh, we are in a much stronger position. And, and actually together, you know, we have roughly 60% of global GDP. So I think we still have the preponderance of power uh, necessary to sh decisively shape um, global outcomes. So I, th I think when possible, we should 
uh, approach, uh, you know, these dictators as a united um, free world. Um, uh, that said, I, I do think there is still room for bilateral communication and, uh, you know, the United States needs to discuss arms control uh, with Russia, uh, for example. Uh, and um, bilateral communication can also be used to communicate threats. And my understanding is that some of the U.S. bilateral communication with Russia recently, you know, including our CIA director's trip to uh, Russia uh, recently, what was to communicate um, threats. Um, so I, I think there is a, a, a balance of, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of confrontation and uh, engagement. You know, we might not always get, get that right, but I do think that, that there is a, a proper balance there. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me now uh, uh, turn to uh, the uh, uh, cultural attaché of the United States uh, to Georgia from the Embassy of the United States in Tbilisi, Mr. Christopher Anderson, for his uh, uh, final remarks. And then let's try to sum up this very, let's say, uh, intensive and uh, all-inclusive discussion. Great, thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, I, I, this has been a really interesting discussion. I'm really glad you're able to join us today. Um, and, and there was the question, you know, what is it that we see as our goal here? And I think that it's we've looked at the bigger picture. What is the strategic? What is the the operational operating environment that we face? What are the threats that we face? And these are really good questions. And I would say at the end of our day, the embassy's goal here is clear and it actually has remained consistent. We support the Georgian people's right to choose and to choose in the democratic sense, we support the Georgian people's right to choose their government. And we also support the Georgian people's right to choose their partners. We are not the ones saying, Georgia, you must be part of NATO. What we are saying is that Georgians, if you want to become part of NATO, we will support you, you have that right. Russia does not have a veto over your foreign policy decisions. Uh, and uh, no one has a veto over your democratic decisions either. There shouldn't be unlawful administrative use of uh, resources. There shouldn't be political pressure. There shouldn't be uh, vote buying. There should be, it's all about the people's, the Georgian people's right to choose. And so the US embassy here has been working in Georgia now for almost 30 years. Next April, we'll, ce we'll celebrate 30 years of operations here in Georgia. And over that time, we have had an incredibly strong and effective military uh, cooperation program. And we have done tremendous work together and really done a lot to strengthen the Georgian military. And some of that is things like providing uh, javelins to help uh, harden your defenses in case Russia decides to advance further into, uh, into Georgia. And again, I think the, the key word is further. We, people sometimes forget that um, Russia is already occupying territory here and in Ukraine, and they talk about an invasion of Ukraine. No, it's further invasion. <laughs> I've seen, I've been to the front lines. I have seen the dividing lines there. Uh, it's further. And so we have provided a lot of support in you know, actual military equipment, very advanced military equipment, but also importantly, training and helping Georgia reform its military to be more effective and more, uh, a, more and stronger to deter, to provide some steel in the Georgian military to respond to the bayonets, because that is who's going to feel it first. Uh, Georgia and Ukraine and Moldova as well, to a somewhat lesser extent, are on the front lines here. Uh, but also, we provide uh, a lot of support to help Georgia's economy grow, because at the end of the day, the military is a key factor, but how strong your military is depends on your economy and depends on the ability of the people. So we have a very effective and very significant economic development program here working in various sectors, whether it's agriculture, uh, high tech or startups. It's, you know, it's really a, a robust series of programs to help strengthen Georgia's economy, to help Georgia be live in a prosperous, more prosperous environment. And finally, I also want to note another key aspect is our exchange programs. Mm -hmm. we, we have about 20 different exchange programs operating in, in Georgia here. And each year we send about 200 people to the United States. And that uh, and so we have sent about 6,000 people over the last 30 years to the United States. And these people are uh, involved in some of the, the most, uh, the largest and most effective startups. They're involved in the military, helping reform efforts in all levels of, of government and also in the arts world. And so we are doing everything we can to help Georgia become a more successful, more prosperous and more integrated member of the Euro-Atlantic family of nations because that is what the Georgian people want. 
we are here to support your choice because uh, this is in our interest. Our strongest asset as the United States is our allies uh, in the foreign policy world. And as I think uh, Dr. Kronig said, if you look at us, one of the huge differences between us and Russia is our allies. We have all these partners who share our goals and share our values and working together, Russia, and I would argue China don't stand a chance. They will adapt to us because we, the, the bulk of the world want to be like us. They want to be our partners. And that's what's scary to, to President Putin. Georgia and Ukraine and all these other cards that the Russia thinks ought to be their friends prefer to be partners with us. And that is the strength of our values and the strength of our example. And that is something we share with the Georgian people, these values of democracy, free markets, and a love of freedom and a strong faith tradition. So with that, I think that's a pretty, hopefully a, a clear example of what it is that we're doing and it's been consistent and it will stay consistent because this is a bipartisan consensus. Thank you very much for this very encouraging uh, words. And uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to co-host this uh, uh, very interesting discussion with the embassy and for everything that embassy has been doing uh, through years and years uh, for strengthening indeed Georgia's democracy, economy, and security. And I'm, I'm pretty convinced that you know, the, the only real deterrent for the Russian Federation uh, in Georgia is really the very strong uh, strategic partnership between Georgia and the United States and the clear uh, communication in words and in deeds from the United States to Russia that actually uh, the things that they have done in 2008 uh, as uh, as uh, the national security advisor to the president, Jake Sullivan, very skillfully said yesterday, you know, the things we should have done in 2014 and that we didn't do, we are prepared to do now. <laughs> so that's, I guess, the that's I guess the the, the most uh, encouraging and uh, um, let's say uh, optimistic way to uh, summarize and end this discussion. Let's, uh, uh, let's hope that uh, this clear communication and actions of the United States and its European allies will change the calculus of the strategic um, decision makers in Kremlin about, uh, Kremlin about what they can and cannot afford to do in this region and in this far, part of the world, in Ukraine, in Georgia in particular, and that this uh, deterrence will uh, finally uh, work for the benefit, not only Ukraine and Georgia or this region or the Black Sea region, but entire Euro-Atlantic uh, security. Okay, so um, with that, I think uh, uh, we, um, we are at the end of our session. So I would, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Kroning, uh, I do not really want to let you go because uh, it is a rare, rare, rare opportunity to talk to you. So please, could you, uh, could you just uh, in a few more uh, words uh, uh, summarize and uh, tell us what is the bottom line and the key takeaway from what uh, we discussed today in your understanding? What, what is the main message you would uh, leave us with uh, here in Tbilisi? Well, uh, first I, I would just say you know, th thank you again very much uh, for having me. It's been uh, a real uh, pleasure and uh, great questions uh, from you and the others. And, and I think the overall message is um, that I think the United States and its allies and partners have built a, a pretty great international system over the past 75 years. Not, not perfect, but better than anything we've ever seen in world history, better than any imaginable uh, alternative. You know, if Russia had, had won the Cold War, I, I think the world would look very different um, and, and worse um, today. Uh, and, but it's not 1945 anymore. It's not 1991 anymore. The world uh, has changed. And so we need to uh, revitalize, adapt, and, and defend this system uh, for a new era. And, and the biggest um, threat to the system, I think, comes from revisionist autocracies uh, like Russia and China. So I think it's very important for the free world um, to work together and, and show a united front uh, to um, to push back and, and impose serious costs where, where they're threatening us. And I think the uh, Georgia is on the front lines um, of this, and so uh, the United States sees Georgia as an important partner. 
And I hope Georgia uh, sees uh, the United States and NATO and Europe as an important partner. And uh, working working together, I, I think we can uh, we can do this. So uh, just uh, end end with an optimistic uh, uh, message. Well, thank you, thank you very much for your very thoughtful uh, remarks. And uh, once again, let me thank uh, Economic Policy Research Center and the Embassy of the United States for this opportunity of discussing this uh, pressing matters with you, uh, Professor Croning, and I thank um, uh, the audience for their uh, active participation through the questions and for their attention. So thank you very, very much. Uh, and uh, this sums up and ends our session for today. Goodbye.